Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your word is a living word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. We ask that you would cut to the division of bone and marrow. You would make us clean. You would speak to us, and then you would bring new life. Breathe to us through your Holy Spirit. Make us to be more like Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. One of our Gordon Conwell graduates is the General Secretary of the Bible Society of Egypt. A number of years ago, I asked this distinguished gentleman who is in a predominantly Muslim country, <clears throat> what's it like to be in charge of a Bible society in a predominantly Muslim country? He made a comment I'll never forget, and it's an observation which I would like to suggest is true also for us in the United States. He said that every year at the National Book Exposition in Cairo, it's a big national book convention, actually it's, it's regional, it's for all of the Middle East, the Bible Society of Egypt has a large display. As a large, mostly secular affair, the big Bible exposition, it's easy for Muslims to move through and to stop by a booth, even the booth of the Bible Society. So I asked, why would Muslims stop by? And he said, for two reasons. Am I going blind or the lights go down? <laughs> oh, shoo, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. There's been a healing already. <laughs> He said there's two reasons they would stop by. One is curiosity. Many are curious about what's in the Bible, but ordinarily they can't go to a Christian store and pick up a Bible, but now it's fairly easy to do so. There's a second reason. The second reason is they have a large banner right by their display in this large international book fair. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Signed, God. <laughs> Muslims stop by and ask, is that really what God is like? That's always what I was hoping God would be like. Tell me about him. A God who beckons us to come to him when we are overburdened, when we are in pain, when we are filled with loneliness and loss or guilt. This is the true God who took up our burden even before we realized we need help. These few verses are very, very important for us all, but especially at this time, the time in which we now find ourselves. I offer this sermon as a solace, as a salve, and even as a signifier. Before I begin, I want to say something about Scripture. This is, after all, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. All scripture is inspired by God and therefore God breathed for edification. However, let's be honest. Each and every passage is not equally as edifying for us, right? I mean, it's okay to say that. You're not going to memorize genealogies, at least most of us aren't, but this. <laughs> you will? You memorize genealogies? Except for Australians, we don't usually memorize genealogies, but this is worth memorizing, right? This is worth remembering at those times in our lives like we find ourselves now. God will use this throughout your life and in your ministry. You need to be able at a very critical time to look at that poor child who's hurting or that mother who's lonely or whose child has just died, look in the eyes and say, let me tell you what Jesus says. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and look at them and not leaf through the Bible and find it somewhere. Three things I want to focus on in our brief time together before Thanksgiving lunch, which is not free. I'm sorry, you have to pay for it. Some people have asked about that. But we do hope you come to lunch anyway. Our situation, God's promise, and the message. Our situation... God's promise and the message. What is our situation? Well, we all recognize it. We all feel it very clearly, and Boston University did a careful study to show us what we already knew, but now it's been quantified. 
As a nation, we are more depressed, lonely, anxious, and angry than before the pandemic. And we're not getting over it yet. Here's what the study has shown the effects of the pandemic on us. Quote, the results show that 27.8% of adults reported depression symptoms in contrast to 8.5% before the pandemic. That's a 300% increase. Increases were higher across the spectrum of depression severity from mild, now 24%, usually 16, before the pandemic, and to severe, now 5% of adults have severe depression. It's usually 0.7%. But of course, it's not only the pandemic, isolation, face masks, lack of touch, and the anxiety of wondering, will it ever be over? On top of all this, as Christians, we are also living in dying Christendom culture. Now, we don't talk about this much, but let me just make some suggestions. We may be critical of Christendom, where the church is often confused with rulers and politics in the secular realm. I've even written about this unfortunate situation. But let's think carefully about it for a moment. It was actually a good thing that basic morality and social ethics and respect, even courtesy, which comes out of our Christian fruits of the spirit, these were supported by the larger culture in the past. Christendom in the United States created a more generous and giving culture than most countries in the world. But now, now these traits are no longer supported by our broader culture. Christendom is dead and we have to adjust to a larger culture which is often at odds with a basic Christian ethos. Basic ethical and moral norms that we could assume, well, like, they can no longer be assumed. It is little things, but it's a lot of little things. Some children as early as kindergarten are now being taught by those in authority, by their teachers, who they're, they're supposed to respect and they're supposed to obey. They're taught they need to think about their gender identity in kindergarten and first grade. There are books they are reading, and as they read it, these books are promoting trans and sexual fluidity. What about my children? Or to be very personal, what about my grandchildren? What are they being taught? Do you tell your children not to listen to their teachers? It's getting very complicated. And then when I travel a lot and go to some places, I have to be careful about restrooms. I didn't used to have to be careful about restrooms. That never used to be a problem. Have you ever seen signs that have a picture of like a half a woman and a half a man? I don't know what that means. That never used to be a problem. At a recent conference, I had to even make a decision. Do I put a little notice on my name tag that says he, him, they, so people know what to call me? I never had to think about that. Is that restroom sign for both men and women? Can I find a single toilet to make this decision easier? Can I talk about upcoming elections with my friends? And, and, and with whom? It's just getting very tense and difficult. It didn't used to be that way. Not when I was at Gordon-Conwell <laughs> decades ago. And then there's free-floating anger. Maybe it's just my position, but it seems like I'm a walking lightning rod. Zap! Oh, where would that come from? There he is, send an angry email. It has never been like that before. Never. Society's changed. We all feel it. I know many of you have the same experience of angry letters and slanderous statements because I've talked to you. I've listened to you. You will get many of them in the ministry, friends. The anxiety the insecurity, the ethical ground shifting. There's an ethical ground shifting taking place. Changing protocols that's put us all on edge. And in ministry, they're going to come after you. And they're going to be fighting together, and you're going to have to mediate. We're all on edge. We're more like a frog in a lily pad, ready to zap any fly that goes by, than like a sloth hanging quietly in the tree. You know, just Hurting people, hurting people. I know there are exceptions, but I think this is very much our present situation. There's a lot of insecurity, which is acting as a mill grinding out anxiety and anger and depression. We're all in need of a savior. Not one who is demanding, but one who is empathetic, understanding, gentle, but strong. 
not one who will pamper us or coddle us, but who will really save us and recreate us, who will redeem us. So here we are, exposed, anxious, and burdened, and Jesus says, come, come. God's promise, that's point two, okay, point two is God's promise. So what exactly is Jesus' promise to us in this passage? Be careful because it's not exactly what you think. Jesus did not say the following, okay? Here are uh, A, B, C, D, E, five things he does not say here. He does not say, relax, it'll be fine. Put up your feet. Now, isn't that better? He didn't say that. Or, you think you have problems? How about trying to be the savior of the world? Or, he doesn't say this, come to me. I'll give you a back rub and help you forget everything. He didn't say that. He doesn't say, I know it's rough out there. Just stay at home, do some aromatherapy, and watch a chick flick. You didn't think I'd say that, did you? And finally, Jesus does not say, did you ever try anger management training? It did wonders for Peter. Remember Peter? <laughs> God's promise in this passage is twofold. First, God is attentive to our situation and he is present in our problems. He knows our burdened and wearisome life, and he reaches out to us. That, that's the image. That's the image I want, want you to keep right there fixed in your head. He reaches out to us right now. Jesus, with outstretched arms, says, come, come. What an absolutely wonderful word, right? Come. It's simple. But it's powerful. It doesn't say, clean up, put on a smile on your face, and then come. It just says, come, just as you are. But notice, the call is the opposite of what he says to the church. Remember, right before he left, before the ascension? Then he said, go. But now he says, come. It's all so confusing. That word is go, but... But there it is. In the midst of going, the call again and again and again is to come. Come to Jesus just as we are. You see, friends, faculty, staff, alumni, board members, wife, Jesus is calling you in the midst of your busyness, in the midst of your serving others, in the midst of your depression and pain and anger. He is calling you to come. That is the first promise. Jesus promises to always be there to call you to himself. And so we are thankful. You knew I'd get something about Thanksgiving in here. We are thankful. He never withdraws his hand. Remember that. You don't need that reassurance today. If you don't need it today, you will need it tomorrow or the next day. And remember, he never withdraws his hand. Come. But there's a second promise and don't miss this, because it's the main point of my sermon. We often don't focus on this. We want the compassion, the understanding, the welcome, but there's also a yoke. There's also a yoke. The second promise is that he will disciple us. Yes, disciple us. That's the word. The word is mathetes in here. He says, you will learn from me. Learn from me, Jesus says. And that's the second part of the promise. It's more than we were counting on, actually. It's not the therapy Jesus saying, come to me and chill for a while. No, no. He says he loves us much more than that. He calls us to himself, and he puts on the yoke, which he shoulders mostly himself, and he guides us along. He puts it on himself, and then he puts it on us. And now he's carrying the heaviest part of the load, but he's yoked us. He's bound himself to us. He's teaching us. He's guiding us. He's showing us the way. We are not alone, but neither are we still. Do you hear that? We're not alone, but we're not still. We are with Jesus, but we're not passive. We are yoked in tilling soil for fruitful ministry. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You see, when we're tired, when we're anxious, Jesus calls us to himself. His hand is there, come. And then he binds himself to us in fruitful ministry. Isn't that great? How do you feel about that? I hope you receive this as a great promise and not as a problem. 
with a little imagination, this is what I think Jesus is saying to us. Are you ready? I will not leave you alone, but neither will I leave you dead in the water or fruitless. Come, let's do this together. Learn from me. Don't worry. I'm right next to you. Come on, come on. Right foot, left foot, right foot, left. Come on, keep me. Okay, let's turn. Oh, let's turn here. Okay, keep moving. Oh, do you see that child over there? Do you see that child crying? Put your arm around him. Ask him why he's crying. Keep moving. Okay, left, right, left. Keep moving. Okay, take up this cake. Take it to your neighbor. She lost her son. She's weary. She's burdened. She's heavy laden. She needs rest. Jesus promises rest and fruitful labor together. Not one, both. This is both and Savior. This is our both and Savior. I will give you rest and I will disciple you. I will invite you in. I will bind myself to you. There's no real fruitful ministry without that rest. And there's no rest except to rest deeper into the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. But I would suggest that's not all. The message, point three, the message. From what we have learned here today, beginning with my little introduction about Egypt, this promise or these promises of Jesus are not just for us. I believe there's a message and a promise for others also. This identification of Jesus, his call to rest and learning, rest and discipleship, is also for a person who is just learning about Jesus for the first time. Who is Jesus, our society is asking. Our neighbors are asking, who is Jesus? They don't know. What is he really like? Can he be trusted? Trusted. I believe there's a message that is not only for needed here for Christians, for the people in the pews here, but for our proclamation to others. Jesus wants you and me to communicate this message to our Lyft driver, our neighbor, and even, Thanksgiving, to our non-Christian relatives. We might ask others, who do you think Jesus is? And part of the answer is here. Jesus is the one who calls you takes on the burden to teach you how to live and how to love. Jesus wants to help you rest and become healed <clears throat> and to show you that you can have a life of helping, loving, and healing others. He will not just help you, but he will help you help others. He's great. Have you ever considered taking on his yoke, being connected to Jesus in all of life? He'll never, never abandon you. There's a reason this is all true. You see, the yoke of learning is a yoke that can be painful and costly. But Jesus has lifted that burden, even as he has lifted the cross. You see, the early church, they would often talk about the symbolism of the cross and the mast and the yoke. They saw that was all connected. The cross, the glorious cross, has become a light and easy yoke for us. And that's the reason to be thankful. I pray you will live into these few verses. Memorize them, recite them this Thanksgiving, but also I hope you will joyfully invite others to take on the yoke of Jesus this holiday season. Are you burdened and heavy laden? Are you worried and anxious? Jesus will give you rest and purpose. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.